things happen as we gear up in the going train. Rotational speed increases, and the force or torque available at each wheel decreases. What does this mean and how does it happen? A clock wheel is just a modified lever with two sides and a pivot point called a fulcrum, like a seesaw. A long board balanced in the center on an arbor or shaft that will rotate. If the length of the two sides of the seesaw are equal, then the force applied to one side will equal the force on the other, and the movement of one side will equal the movement on the other. This is called a one-to-one -one ratio. Now if we move the weight on the left towards the pivot point, the situation changes. If a 10 pound weight is one foot from the fulcrum on the left side, it will only take one pound to balance it 10 feet from the fulcrum on the right side. This is a 10 to 1 ratio. It looks like we lost power, but we didn't. We converted the force into movement, or distance traveled. On the left, if the 10 pound weight moves one foot, the one pound weight on the right will move 10 feet. The actual amount of power stays the same. We just convert some of the force into movement. On the left, 10 pounds times one foot of movement equals 10 foot pounds. On the right, one pound times 10 feet of movement equals the same, 10 foot pounds. In a clock, the pinion acts as the short side of the lever, with the wheel acting as the long side. The arbor is the fulcrum or the pivot point. The difference between levers and wheels is that wheels continuously interact with each other and the movement is rotational rather than linear. We start with a large power source in the great wheel and transfer it to the pinion of the second wheel, from the second wheel to the pinion of the third wheel and so forth. Each time we do this the driving force or torque is reduced but the rotational distance traveled in each stage is increased. Here we have two levers connected together in the same manner that one clock wheel would drive another. In this case, each lever has a 10 to 1 ratio. As before, the lever on the left starts with a 10 pound weight on the left side of the pivot point and is offset by a 1 pound weight 10 feet away. We are converting the 10 pounds of force on the left to 1 pound of force moving 10 times the distance on the right side of the first lever. Now we add a second lever in place of the one pound weight. The effective force on the left or input side of the second lever is one pound coming from the first lever and 10 feet away on the second lever, this one pound of force is offset by one tenth of a pound. We've also again multiplied the distance moved by 10, which gives us an end to end movement of 100 to one. Of course, this is impractical in straight levers, but this 100 to 1 total ratio and much more is done in the simplest clock by turning the levers into the rotation of pinions and wheels. Here we see two clock wheels with 5 to 1 ratios working together. A one tooth movement of the first pinion moves the outer edge of the first wheel 5 teeth. Since the first wheel directly engages the second pinion, the second pinion is forced to move 5 teeth, which moves the outer edge of the second wheel 25 teeth but with 1 25th of the starting torque or force. Also, notice that we multiply the ratio of the levers, not add, to get the overall end-to-end -end ratio. Two 10 to 1 ratio levers working together create a 100 to 1 total ratio, not 20 to 1. Two 5 to 1 ratio levers create a 25 to 1 ratio, not 10 to 1. We'll cover this again when we get into the motion works. Let's look at how the power and torque is distributed through the going train. Here we have the going train with levers superimposed over the wheels. Here is a typical wheel train with the wheels replaced by levers. I've calculated the torque or pressure applied to each wheel starting with a 10 pound driving weight all the way up to the escape wheel. The final force available at the escape wheel to drive the pendulum after the force of a 10 pound weight is converted to rotational speed through the going train is 1.4 grams. That's less than the weight of a US nickel. This is not much force to keep the pendulum moving. If you want a practical demonstration of the loss of torque through the wheel train, take the winding key and feel the force of the spring or weight as you wind the clock. Now touch the escape wheel. You can stop it with a feather. So why do we care about all this force and torque stuff? The answer is friction. 
Friction is the most common cause of a mechanical clock stopping. As the lubrication dries up, parts wear, and everything gets coated with dirt, friction increases until there's not enough force left to overcome it, and the clock finally stops. <music>